Let me read to you a passage from the 15th chapter of St Luke's Gospel, verses 1 to 10. It's the Gospel for Thursday of the 31st week in Ordinary Time, Year 2. St Luke writes, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complained. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them, they said. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's from Luke chapter 15 verses 1 to 10. And what does it suggest to us? Well, you know, one of the great books on the philosophy and the phenomenology of religion was Rudolf Otto's book entitled The Idea of the Holy. In it, Otto describes the experience of the holy that the religions of man embody in their rites and myths. He says that the holy is experienced as, to use his phrase, tremendum et fascinans, that is to say, awesome and winning. It is perceived as power and beauty, might and goodness. The numinous, the holy, overawes, and yet it draws. You know, the discussion about the experience of the numinous in religions is almost endless. And I remember reading a British anthropologist, he was Evans Pritchard, who wrote that the religions of man, and he was speaking especially of indigenous religions, cannot be simplified to a rule. Well, whatever of all that, if we take Otto's proposal and bring it to bear on revealed religion, how great must be our surprise at the figure of Christ the Son of God made man. The great and infinite God was made flesh and dwelt among us. St. John writes in his Gospel that we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Now would we not expect him to be, as Otto puts it, tremendum et fascinans? There are many earthly rulers who surround themselves with such an heir. But consider what we read in our Gospel today. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. St. Paul writes in one of his letters that the Son possessed the form and glory of God, but he did not cling to it, but gave it all up and became as we men are, and humbler still, even to death on the cross. Now what was the meaning of this? The meaning of it was that the love of God was being revealed. St. John writes in one of his letters that God is love. Christ, in his humility and accessibility, was revealing the life and character of God. God is utter love. And that is what the tax collectors and the sinners were sensing very profoundly in Jesus. They were drawn to him, though they knew they were sinners. 
Jesus is God. And here in our passage today, we have the Pharisees incom- uncomprehendingly criticizing him for his love. Their charge against him, in effect, is the way you are acting is uncharacteristic of God who hates sin and cannot associate himself with it. Sinners, therefore, are not loved but punished. God separates himself from sinners and will not come near to them. We do not sin, and so God is near to us but not to them. Well, there are many things we could say about that attitude. And in respect to God's separation from sin and from sinners, there is of course a certain truth in what they said. And for this very reason they were seduced into murmuring against the Son of God himself. But they had not understood the revelation of God's love, both in the Old Testament and, above all, in the person of Jesus. God's holiness is a holy love, and it led him to send his Son to save the world from sin. God's holiness leads him to give himself for the salvation of sinners. His love leads him to expiate for the sin of the world. And so our Lord proceeds to tell two parables illustrating the love of God for sinners. God is like the shepherd who seeks out the stray, or the woman who searches till she finds her coin. The sinner is like the sheep that has wandered off, or like the coin that has been mislaid. Both are precious to their owners. The sheep leads, the sheep, the shepherd rather, leaves the rest of the flock and pursues the straying sheep till he finds it. I tell you, our Lord says, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. The woman will not give up till she has found her coin. In the same way, our Lord continues, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of, of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What this means is that the attitude of the Pharisees is absolutely unlike that of God. And it means that our attitude ought be like that of Jesus. We must never accept sin, either in our own life or in the life of others, but we must love the sinner. Let us hate sin, and out of love for God avoid sin. If we sin, let us repent. Let us, though, love the sinner and do all we can to assist him to turn to God and repent from his sin, in a spirit of love. In everything our model is Jesus, Jesus the sinless one who loved sinners. He gave his life in expiation for the sin of the world. And by his gift of the Holy Spirit, we are able to turn away from sin and live for God. Because of grace, each and every sinner has the chance to turn from sin and gradually attain holiness of life. 